does. I want to get the same thing for that. And it's up to you to learn the deal with it. So the council is down at the very Dallas, low ridge, that I remember signing the Dallas. So I had to say, Hello, everybody. <laughs> Hi, and welcome to the Sierra Club Huron Valley Group's hybrid monthly program meeting for March 2024, the Spring Equinox Total Solar Eclipse Purim and Ramadan edition. <laughs> for those who celebrate, we wish a Ramadan Mubarak and hope that the month will end in peace. Thanks to Erica and Jason for tech support tonight. We are the Sierra Club. The Sierra Club is the nation's oldest and largest environmental group. Our motto is explore, enjoy, and protect the planet. If you aren't already a member, um, please join at sierraclub.org. The Huron Valley Group is the Sierra Club group that represents Washtenaw, Monroe, and Lenawee counties. Dan Ezekiel, the program chair of the Huron Valley Group, is on the road. So I'm Una, I'm Dan's intern, and I help manage the Zoom. We have a particularly special program tonight, so thanks for coming out. We'd like to take a moment to acknowledge all the lands where the Huron Valley Group operates are the homelands of the Mississauga, Ojibwa, Odawa, and Potawatomi, and other Native peoples. And also a moment, also a moment to get to know each other. So please introduce yourself to someone nearby. <laughs> if you haven't already. <laughs> Amazing. We have some wins this month. I'm pleased to report that the National Sierra Club has taken the step of endorsing the environmentalists, President Biden and Vice President Harris for re-election. As we have done for the last few elections, we're writing letters to low propensity voters um, on the second Tuesday of every month at the Argus Farm Stop on Packard from 6 to 8 p.m. The next event will be Tuesday, April 9th. The letter writing takes place in the basement of Argus Farm Stop, 1200 Packard. And if you're able, please bring 20 envelopes and 20 stamps. But if that's a problem for you, the most important thing is that you show up and write about why you vote um, and the HVG can take care of the envelopes and the stamps. In 2020 and 2022, the HVG sent 1500 handwritten letters each year. And we're gonna see if we can meet or exceed that number in 2024. You can find those events on the meetup site. Um, I'd like you to not sign a petition that will be soon be going around to put a referendum on the ballot to allow local communities to have the ultimate decision on citing renewable energy infrastructure. Recently, we honored Mike Buza, chair of the Nepessing Group up in Flint for his heroic work in helping fight disinformation, which is often paid for by oil companies that is used to get rural communities in Michigan to disallow solar and wind farms. As we noted, the state legislature got on board and gave the ultimate authority of these decisions and was given the ultimate authority for those decisions. Now there's a group circulating petitions to overturn that law. Um, I probably don't need to tell you who is funding said group. Please use your influence and network to discourage friends and family from signing the petition as well. And an additional early warning, we're going to be do, doing something different in May um, when our presenter will be um, Kathy Reichel, who will be teaching us about e-bikes and how to plan your first e-bike trip. Um, while next month's program will be here, um, as usual, May's program will be at the Ann Arbor District Library in the downtown location on Fifth Avenue on the fourth floor and will be at a different time. So that's Tuesday, May 21st at 6.15 instead of 7.30. And we will not have a Zoom in May, though the program will be available later streaming on YouTube. Um, this is an experiment and it will be interesting to see whether the downtown library suits our needs better than MathI. We're hoping it will. There's a bus line. It's a lot more centrally located, particularly um, for those without cars. Um, and it has outst outstanding audiovisual resources and will be more convenient for socializing before and afterwards. But it is just an experiment. We look forward to your feedback as we decide whether to continue with that model or this one. Next month, we will be here at MathI in person and we'll have a Zoom. Our presenter will be Barbara Lucas and she'll be teaching us about pocket forests, including the project that is underway in Burr Park. Barbara describes her program this way. Many forests of native trees and shrubs are being planted across the globe to address biodiversity loss, tree inequity, and climate change. They are inspired by methods first developed in the 1960s by the late Akira Miyawaki. Barbara and other local volunteers are striving to bring this movement to our area. And you can check out pocketforest.org for more information. So please join us for that program, Tuesday, April 16th, here at MathEye or on Zoom, 7.30 to 9. 
And finally, this month, our presenters are John Mursky and Jane Apple <laughs> Wayne Appleyard, <laughs> here to teach us about heat pumps. Um, John Mursky is a retired engineer and a former chair of the A2 Energy Commissioner, and Wayne Appleyard is an architect and also a former A2 Energy Commissioner, former chair. Um, and I will let them finish introducing themselves. So without further ado, let's welcome them. Take it away. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Hope we have a lot of people out there in Zoom land as well. Uh, Wayne and I are going to talk about uh, residential heat pumps. Um, I'm going to do the easy stuff. He's going to do the hard stuff. Uh, and so uh, I'll start out real quickly. First of all, uh, just like to uh, ask a couple of audience questions. I don't be able to see the people on Zoom, but uh, just like to get a little bit of the lay of the land. Who owns their own home? Okay. Who, who rents? Obviously, the okay, there we are. Okay, then who owns a heat pump already? I have one in my refrigerator. Ah, you're already giving something away. Oh, is that right? Good one. That Perfect. is, it is. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, so uh, we don't have any apparently either on Zoom. Did anybody indicate that they do? So the, the best known types are air source heat pumps, which we'll cover, and ground source or geothermal. Uh, and then there's a question about other, and we'll get to that uh, in a second. Um, so what does an electric heat pump do? Well, first of all, the electric part is important. Uh, you need an electric power source to plug your heat pump into. and in uh, we obviously want that to be powered by 100% renewable energy because it's clean and doesn't hit emit any greenhouse gases. And in this case here, we're trans the heat pump is transferring heat from um, an outside source, either air or ground or sometimes water, and I'll get into that. And in this case, where the container that you see there um, is a home, it replaces typically a, a fossil gas furnace. Um, and heats the building. But a heat pump can also pump and transfer heat in the opposite direction. Uh, and that in this case, if the container is a home or a building, then it replaces an air conditioner. So as Newt indicated just a minute ago, um, there are already one-way heat pumps in your home. Uh, and examples of those are refrigerators, freezers, air conditioners, and even dehumidifiers. So if you've ever stood on the other side or two sides of an air conditioner, you see on one side, there is uh, cold, for example, being pumped into your home. And at the same time, if you go on the outside of the house and stand there, you have heat that is being pushed in the other direction. So it's actually pumping heat in a sense out of your home into the exterior air. So all of you, know what a heat pump is if you think about it in those terms. And these are all air source heat pumps. There's, in the case tonight where we're, the presentation is gonna focus on, we're gonna talk about two-way heat pumps. And those are used for heating, uh, ventilation and air conditioning. And there are two major categories, air source heat pumps, as I indicated earlier, and ground source heat pumps. And then in particular for air source heat pumps, there are lots of different varieties um, there are ducted systems that basically can plug right into a typical ducted home. There are ductless units that can be uh, also called uh, mini splits. We'll show you what those look like. There are combined ducted and mini split uh, installations. There are also dual fuel ducted systems. We'll show you all these and air to water systems. And then, as I mentioned, there are uh, ground source heat pumps or geothermal systems. So why, why are we talking about residential heat pumps or re heat pumps in general? Um, first of all, if you look on the left, uh, altogether buildings together with the electricity that power the lights and appliances and for fuels that heat those buildings uh, make up about 30% of total uh, CO2 emissions. And then if you take that and you look at just the residential sector and you look at the two red boxes that I have here, um, heating and air conditioning. And by the way, obviously, this varies depending on what part of the country you are. This is for the U.S. in total. 
but heating and air conditioning is almost 45 percent of our total use of electricity and then if you add in uh water heating which is here to the the left and then also in a clothes dryer those can also actually be done using heat pumps so heat pumps all together can address really a significant, the vast majority, or certainly a majority of all the heating needs in your home. So that's why it's important. And most of these right now are being run either by gas furnaces or in many cases, even gas dryers, et cetera. And we wanna get away from burning uh, fossil fuels because of the emissions and they're linked to obviously, or the a driving of, of climate change and, and global warming. So I'm not gonna get real technical, uh, but basically, this is uh, the components that are that make up a heat pump. Uh, first of all, in the lines that you can see going around, there's a refrigerant. And that refrigerant can either be in vapor form or in liquid form, depending on where it is in the cycle. But the major components of what you see physically are a uh, exterior coil and a fan on the outside. Um, you have a reversing valve in the case of a two-way heat pump. You don't have that in a one-way heat pump like an air conditioner or a refrigerator or freezer. A compressor, and all of us know that we have a compressor with those types of units. Then you have an interior coil with a fan as well, and you can see the fan there as well, and um, an uh, expansion device. And in this case, you can see essentially heat is being pumped from the outside into the inside of the house. You don't really have to understand the physics of it, but actually there is quite a bit of heat in air on the outside of a home or from a ground source, even when the temperature dips down to zero degrees, minus 10, minus 15 degrees. And we can get into that later in the Q&A, but you'd be surprised that uh, you can actually extract heat out of that air, that cold air, and use that in, to heat your home. When you cool a house in air conditioning mode, everything basically just runs in reverse. So basically the refrigerant in the cycle that the refrigerated, refrigerant runs is in reverse and you're essentially blowing uh, air over the coil on the inside of the house, um, removing that heat and then dumping it on the outside of the house. So I'm gonna show you some representative images, in some cases, sort of schematics of different types of heat pump system. This is a ducted system. You can see the wall and roof of the house uh, sort of in the middle. You have an outside unit that looks almost exactly like an outside air conditioning unit. The refrigerant lines run inside the house, and they run into a unit that looks almost identical, as you'll see later, to a furnace, uh, taking up basically the same footprint. Um, that houses the coil on the inside of the house as well as the fan as you can see on the right side and at the bottom there are in some cases an auxiliary typically electric resistance heat so if you live in a very very cold climate and you need additional heat then what the pump heat pump can accomplish on its own especially if it's not a very efficient unit some people augment that with uh, electric heat you can have enhanced uh, 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 for air filtration, and then you can see coming out the top, you've got uh, either cool air in the case of summer where you're air conditioning or warm air in the case of winter when you're heating. And that's, of course, controlled by a thermostat, just like your normal furnace would be or your air conditioner. So here's some examples of what a mini split system looks like. Um, the name makes sense because, again, you have a split um, on the outside, you've got the coil, fan unit, compressor, reversing valve, and the expansion device. And on the inside, you have just a unit, which is a coil and a fan unit. And these are particularly useful for smaller spaces or for maybe a finished room over the garage or in a case where you have several rooms that are in an open layout where you can service that from one um, ventilation point. A dual fuel system is just what it sounds like, almost identical kinds of setup, but what you see here highlighted with the box in red on the right-hand side is that you can also essentially pair it with a gas furnace. And just like I talked before about having auxiliary resistance heating, this serves the purpose of when it gets really, really cold, when the 
uh, air force, the, the, the air, the heat pump is not as efficient as it might normally be at a warmer te temperature because there's just not that much heat in the air to extract. Then you use this furnace, this gas furnace typically then to provide extra heat, but that really operates only under extreme conditions. Okay. Go keep on going. Okay. So another, another type of uh, heat pump system is an air to water heat pump system. I know you can't read this very well, but what's important at the top is basically your baseboard heating and your radiant heaters. So as you know, when you have those, you typically have a boiler that's heating water and that water is then feeding in through your radiator. In a case of a, a boiler system, you're heating that water to close to essentially boiling. In the case of an air to water heat pump, you're only heating that water to about 130 degrees. It's running, it can run through the same system, but you're, you don't have, basically you're running that kind of system almost continuously to be able to get enough output for your system. These are relatively new to the market. The volumes are low and therefore the, they're relatively expensive. So now I'm gonna switch and talk about ground source heat pump. So instead of the air being the source, or the recipient of the heat or the, the cooling. In this case, the ground is. And there's a number of different ways of accessing the heat or the, the, the ground, if you will. Um, there is, starting from left to right, there is uh, typically done here in Southeastern Michigan, vertical wells or a vertical field. These are anywhere from one to, it can be a very, very high number for commercial buildings, um, 50, even 200 uh, vertical wells that are typically in the range of 300 to 600 feet. Um, another option that is used here is a, a looped system. These are often put in trenches. So they just take a trenching machine that may go like 20, 25 feet deep and just put a looped coil in that, in that trench. So you can access the heat of the ground that way. There's um, in some cases where they do a horizontal type of field. That's not very common, certainly not here. What you do see in Michigan and other places where people have access to a lake or to a pond is they will put their field or their coil, if you will, at the bottom of the lake or the pond. In the case of it being in the ground, the ground temperature here is roughly 55 degrees. It can vary 50 and a little bit warmer than that. So you have pretty much a constant heat source in the case of water. That's obviously not the case because that'll vary a lot more. Certainly that depends on the, also the depth of the, the lake or the pond. So how do you do that? As I said, most of the time here in Southeastern Michigan, uh, geothermal or ground source heat pump, those wells are drilled. There's drilling rigs. This is actually pictures of the rigs being installed at our home. We have a geothermal system. We have three wells. They're about 375 feet deep. They all feed into one reservoir and then that reservoir feeds um, our house. And what does that look like? That's what it looks like. That's our mechanical room in our basement. And I have my hand re resting on our geothermal internal unit, which is basically the inside coil and the fan. Um, in our case, uh, the total installation was roughly $50,000. That was before any kinds of credits or rebates. We did this um, in 2014 to early 2015. Um, and uh, But this is the cost in today's cost. There's a number of different ways to measure the efficiency of heat pumps. There are three sort of common ways, a SEER, um, value or rating, an HFPF rating, and a COP rating or an S-COP rating. Um, the important thing to remember is the higher the rating, the more efficient it is. And certainly in the case of Michigan, you want a relatively high efficiency heat pump because especially at lower temperatures, you're going to be working all the time running that with electricity to try to extract heat out of that colder air. So the more efficient the heat pump, in the long run, you're gonna pay for that. You really do not want to in install, um, you wanna install what are called cold climate heat pumps. Wayne will talk about that earlier, and those are the high efficiency heat pumps. And the last slide I'm gonna talk about is heat pump sales. You can see these compared to uh, furnaces. Furnaces are in red, heat pumps are in blue, and you can see starting in 2012, 
heat pump sales have really started to increase. By the way, there's an anomaly in the very last year, 2023, as everybody knows, interest rates were very high. There was not as much building. There were some inventory levels that were not used up. So sales went down. But if you look at the overall trend, there's a, a really fairly steep increase in the sales of heat pumps. And that is because they're getting cheaper, they're getting more efficient, and people are talking to each other, like in programs like tonight. So people are realizing that this is really an interesting and viable option. And then I would say on top of that, there's just a much greater awareness that we need to make this energy transition and getting away from burning fossil fuels and working with renewable energy to drive things like heat pumps. So I'm gonna turn things over to Wayne. Yes. Thank you. So, um... What order should we do things in? And it really makes, uh, it's kind of important to do things in the right order uh, for the best results. Since um, if you haven't done all the energy efficiency work you can do on your house, it's a good idea to do that before you put a heat pump in because the energy efficiency changes are gonna change the size of the heat pump. And you want the heat pump to be properly sized. So there's a number of ways to do that. Uh, coming online this spring is the Ann Arbor Home Energy Advisor, which is a free service that uh, OSI at, at the city is providing, and they can answer all your questions and help guide you through the process. Um, you, um, they have, um, you can have someone do a home energy assessment um, which quite often includes a blower door, which is an interesting device. They basically open your front door and stick this device in it, and it's got a fan that basically um, either pressurizes or depressurizes your house. And depending upon how the level, what the level of difference in pressure between both sides of of the unit, it'll tell you you how leaky your house is. At the same time, they can wander around your house um, either with a, a radon, a, a infrared. infrared gun, or with a smoke um, candle and find where the leakage is. And so, um, one of the big things that most people's houses need is to be a little tighter than it than it was. So they can they can leak, they can uh, fill up those leaks so that your house is more efficient. Um, the other thing is to look at uh, the, what your equipment looks like, what condition it's in, and an interesting part is the size of your electrical pin, because an electric source, air source heat pump or geothermal heat pump requires a fair amount of electricity. Um, mine has a 50 amp breaker on it, so it, it it has to have you have to have the capacity in the panel. Uh, before you can install a heat pump. So the energy advisors will be able to look at that and tell you whether you need to upgrade your service. Uh, so then you want to increase the envelope uh, as much as you can by adding insulation in addition to, to, um, to tightening it up. Um, and you, the last thing you should do after you get your heat pump is get some solar because the way the utilities allow, they only allow you 10% above what you use in the way of electricity as far as the size of your solar array. And so if you're already using as much as you gotta use because you've installed the heat pump, then you could actually put a larger system in that can meet more of your needs. It's actually the order that I did buying it. So, um, and there, there's a lot of different ways that your house loses heat, infiltration is, is a big one. Um, it's cheap to install ceiling insulation usually in the attic because they're just blowing it in and there's a lot of space for that. Um, above grade walls, if there isn't insulation, um, you can add it. Most people have it in the, and there may not be an easy way to improve that. Um, windows are an interesting thing in that it usually is a long payback to, to replace windows. So although it's those things that People go, oh, I need new windows, so that's a good thing to do. It's, it's, um, you may be better off getting better storms and doing some caulking or some other things as opposed to actually replacing the windows. Um, 
quite often people who have basements have rim joists, which is the, the floor section where it meets the outside wall above the concrete basement. That is quite often not insulated. And having that insulated and sealed first can make a big difference into how much air is lost uh, from the house. Uh, and then basement walls can be up to 30% of the heat loss of, of a house. So those should be insulated on the inside if it's an existing house. So system sizing. First thing to know is that they all come in usually half ton capacities. So what's a ton? A ton is 12,000 BTUs. It's the amount of energy that it took to melt a ton of ice. So hence the name ton. Um, and so uh, there are usually for residential uses, they're available in the one to five tons. So it's 12,000 to 60,000 BTUs. Don't look at your furnace and say, oh, my furnace is bigger than that. And so I'm going to need two heat pumps. You might, but more often than not, the furnace is oversized. Because when an installer comes in, instead of actually doing precise calculations, they just want to make sure you're going to be toasty warm when it's zero degrees out and they don't want you to call them back. So they put in something a little bigger and the difference in cost isn't that much. So then um, it's very important to have the proper sized wells or horizontal loops on for the geothermal. That's, that's the part that's the trickiest. And if you skimp on that, what happens is that you're sucking more heat out of the ground than it's being replenished from the, the heat moving through the soil. And that drops the input temperature to your heat pump and makes it work harder. And I've seen a lot of variation in how well a geothermal heat pump works, depending upon how big the transfer uh, coils are. So it's really important to get those sized right. In, in commercial units, they actually will install one and then run water through it and test it to see how much heat they can get out. But usually on residential, it's not cost effective to do that. So code for a new house is to do this AACA manual J, manual J. And basically someone looks at the house, they calculate how many square feet of windows have, how, how many square feet of walls you have, how much uh, roof you have, uh, and what the insulation values are, and come up with a maximum heat loss, which is dependent upon our particular climate. Um, I'm not sure how often that's done. It's required by code, and I've never been able to really get a figure because I know some places, especially with existing homes, the installer comes in and they make a calculated guess, or they look at what you have and they size it accordingly, or they tell you, well, what you really need is a dual furnace system, dual fuel system, because the heat pump can't do what your house needs, which may or may not be true. So the important thing, probably the most important thing is, John said, it, is with an air source heat pump, it's got to be what they call a cold climate heat pump. And the way what's different, and this is something that really revolutionized heat pumps in cold climates, is they have a variable refrigerant flow compressor on. So it can move different quantities of fluid and vapor through the system, depending upon how much heat you need and what the response is for moving some of that through. Uh, and the curious thing about it all is that actually if you oversize the system somewhat so that it's not running at full capacity, as long as it's not below its minimum so that it short cycles, it's actually going to work more efficiently. And I've I've seen the data from companies and it's totally opposite. I've had people tell me that the installer says, no, 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 if you oversize it, then it's not going to work right. Well, that's the way it used to be. But with these new cold climate systems, it's different. So <clears throat> important, uh, it's different. It's the heat pump is different than a fossil fuel furnace in that it doesn't ha necessarily have the same output at differing outdoor temperatures. And that's important to know. The real good ones like Fujitsu and Mitsubishi and some of the carrier units 
will do a, their rated capacity down to about zero degrees and then it drops off. Um, and so it's important to really know what it does at the three temperatures that um, we see here, 47, 17, and five. Um, the output at those lower temperatures will determine how much backup you might need. And the backup part is really important because this is another place that doing it wrong can mean that you spend a lot more money on your operating cost. If the Because the backup system, if it's electric resistance, which is usually what we do if we're trying to do an all electric home, uh, is one to one. It One unit of energy comes in and, and it goes out through the resistance coil. The heat pump can be between 2.7 and four times the amount of incoming energy. So it's much more efficient to use the heat pump than the resistance heaters. And uh, one of the other tricks with it is that, that it has to do with how the whole system is, is monitored with the thermostat. So we like to have it a cooler temperature at night. If I have my resistance heater in my system set up so it'll come on automatically and I drop the temperature enough at night so that we feel comfortable in our bedroom, when the thermostat kicks up, the resistance heater tries to come on saying, well, we're not meeting the load by over a certain amount. So if you have much of a setback, you can actually do yourself harm by using more of that resistance energy, which is less efficient than the heat pump energy. So what I've done with my house is I figured out that it was okay down to about two degrees and a 30 mile an hour wind, and which almost never happens. So I just keep the resistance heaters off because, because I don't want them to come back on, uh, you know, in the morning when the thermostat kicks up and we like it cooler. So having it sized right really helps keep you from spending more um, electricity. It's important to realize that the output temperature is uh, of the, is quite different. It's 125 degrees as opposed to maybe 150 or 160 out of a out of a gas furnace, and that makes your house feel different in a really wonderful way because it runs longer at a lower temperature, and because the fans are all variable speed and everything, they're very quiet, and it's almost like you have radiant heat and you don't know, you know, and and there's no way that you can know whether it's running or not. Uh, after we got ours for several months, my wife would go out the door with less clothes on than she needed because she thought it was warmer outside because the temperature was so nice and she didn't know that the furnace was on. But she's figured it. She's pretty smart. So it's important to realize that there's a lot more heating in our climate than there is cooling. So it's important that we work for the cooling efficiency side. The heating side is less important and we yeah, can we adjust that. Yeah, so the he heating side is less important. Oh, the heating side is more important. The cooling side is less important. And we have more flexibility as far as being comfortable when it's hot out. Uh, we don't need to have it at 68. We can have it at a higher temperature. And these new systems, have a drying mode where they run the system so that it actually pulls more moisture out of the air and is less trying to really cool things down, but just trying to get the humidity down, which is a good portion of our problem here. So get a large enough system, um, size the system for at least 90% if you can or more. And um, if you do get a a dual fuel system, make sure that you can adjust that change over temperature. People got into those partially either because they already had a really nice furnace that was too young to throw out, or they didn't think the, the heat pump was gonna actually do it all. So they wanted the assurance that that backup heat would be there. Um, and for a long time, these things didn't do very well at really cold temperatures, but they do wonderfully well now. They really do. So avoid it if you can, because 
it's kind of like having the hybrid car that I have. It's sort of the worst of both worlds. It, it's an electric car and it's a gas car. So it makes everything more complex. Uh, these are a range of costs because uh, it can vary quite a bit. Um, there are very, very good tax credits for ground source heat pumps because there's no limit on it. So 30% of your total costs is covered that way. Uh, with an air source heat pump, um, there's a limit of $2,000. So it's a little less. And, uh, oh, sure. How do I go back? <laughs> this, of course, is dependent on the size of the house. Oh, you know, very, very much. A square foot house is going to be different than a 2,500 square foot house. Office. And who's doing it? And who's doing it? <laughs> It's amazing the variation, you know, working with a contractor, you can get a, quite a range with different contractors and one person will say it's going to be cheaper this way and the other person says, no, 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 it's going to be cheaper that way. So uh, anyways, I digress. Talk to Wayne if you have <laughs> Sure. I take a lot of phone calls about this stuff. I love talking to people about heat pumps because I think they're, I mean, they're really important because we have to get a, away from burning stuff. And uh, they're so comfortable and, and uh, work so well. So these are some estimates. And th this is a slide that I said kind of some respects got away from me um, in that there's something in each one of these categories that I might change if I got farther into the weeds. on. But it's a good general idea as to your costs. And certainly, you don't want to do electric resistance heating. It's outrageously expensive. Gas, unfortunately, or fortunately for some people, is very cheap. It won't always be that case. Uh, it's cheap now because of fracking. And as we start shipping more and more of this gas overseas, uh, it's going to go up. And then we just can't afford to burn it because of, of CO2 emissions. Uh, if you don't have natural gas, which is where I was, it became really easy because <laughs> I I cut my costs in half uh, by going to an air source heat pump over the oil furnace that I was was using. <clears throat> it also tried to burn my house down, so it was really a good idea to get rid of it. Uh, so propane oil, it's easy. Um, it's a little bit more difficult with gas, but we need to do it for any number of reasons. Among other things, people's houses blow up the gas occasionally. So, and then you can see the variation between the cold climate architect, or cold, cold climate air source heat pump uh, and the geothermal. Um, and those, those numbers are, are about right, I think. Oh, the other thing about that, that, let me go back once. Geothermal in DTE's territory has a wonderful rate. It, it, they're one of the few utilities in the country that have a reduced rate for using a geothermal heat pump. So it's only, depending upon off-peak and on-peak, it's about 14 cents a kilowatt hour instead of 19 cents. Uh, and so that really, really helps. Um, so how to pay for it? Cash on hand is really great because there's no interest involved with that. Um, you can get a home improvement loan or a home equity warm loan. Um, or Michigan Saves is a really good option. If It's basically, we're one of the few states that has what we call a green bank. It was set up with a large amount of money that we got from somewheres. And it basically guarantees loads. So... Um, it'll, if the loan is guaranteed, the bank or credit union will give you a lower interest rate. So they're able to give you a lower interest rate. They also have a good program of filtering contractors. So they have a contractor list on their website. It's not perfect, but uh, they keep an eye on people. And so if you work with one of those, you're probably going to be better off. Or if they're not there, that's kind of a red flag. One other thing about Michigan Saves, it's not just uh, loans for heat pumps. You can use it for any number of different energy efficiency activities, from insulation to 
um, more efficient appliances and so on and so forth. And solar. Yeah, solar. So, and then there's federal tax credits. Uh, and uh, soon there'll be additional uh, IRA rebate credits and rebates. So these are the federal credits uh, as they stand now. So any of those energy improvements that you could do, you can get some of it back from your taxes, providing you're pay paying taxes. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's pretty much it. Um, we have some resources here. Uh, OSI at the city uh, is doing some great things. Uh, you should look on the website. They're coming out with um, their whole energy advisor program. They, as of today, I think it is, there's now um, a requirement that when you sell a house that you get what amounts to a very simple energy audit and, and supply that to a potential buyer. So the buyers know that uh, what they're getting into as far as their, their energy costs and how they might improve it. So um, some really good stuff going there. Uh, the electrification expo that they have every year, uh, they get a lot of good vendors on heat pumps and various other things, ways to electrify. And uh, usually one or two of us are sitting at a table explaining heat pumps to people as well. So, and then um, there's some other uh, Forbes and, and uh, the, enter, the federal government has other websites that are helpful. And I think that's it, isn't it? It is. And we'll open it up for questions. Uh, what one comment that I wanted to make uh, is when Wayne was talking about these concerns in about low temperature operations, that's really only applies to air source heat pumps, because remember, the source of your heat is the outside air. And if your air uh, is at minus 20 degrees, there's a lot less heat available than there is at 32 degrees or something like that. Whereas if you have a ground source heat pump or a geothermal heat pump, like we have, uh, that is always using the ground at 55 degrees. So even if the air temperature is very, very cold, you have a constant source. So you really don't have to worry about all these issues. We have built into our heat pump a resistance heating element. We've been in our home for almost nine years. We've never used it. So even on the coldest day, we're comfortable in our home. And as Wayne said, the nice thing is, is that it's this subtle, heat. It's very, very comfortable. You don't have this cycling of really warm air blowing on you. And then 15 minutes later, you're starting to feel chilly and you're looking for a blanket. You have much more even heat. So here's just an example of an air source heat pump. And you can see uh, how the capacity varies in the efficiency, which is the COP, will vary uh, depending upon temperature. And it, it really does pretty, pretty well. Um, down to, to five degrees, it's still putting out um, its rated capacity at that five degrees so that there isn't, um, it, it's really not necessary to have much of a backup. I, I, I will say that you're gonna have 55 degree water with a geothermal if everything is sized right. And, that's always the issue. I, there's a study that I looked at where they looked at 49 houses in New York State, and there was there was more fluctuation. It wasn't 55, and there were times that it got down to a lower temperature. Didn't mean that it didn't work well. They they still all worked well, but the efficiency was a little different as it drops because the efficiency is related to among other things the difference between the temperature you're pulling from and the temperature that you want. And the temperature you want is probably going to stay the same, but that other temperature will fluctuate. Yes, John. So you've been talking about heat pumps for uh, like single family homes where the heat pump sits right outside your building. Yeah. And, and uh, the play, I live at University of Commons and we have 60 units in a big brick building and each of those units has a small 
the Aspergillus, the bends up to the roof. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to, in retrofitting buildings to put an air source heat pump on the roof and then go down to the uh, unit using the existing chase to uh, then pump your cold, your warm air out through the, the normal air system? You have an air conditioning system, I assume, right? Is that I think most of these people do have right. an air conditioning system up on the roof. Right. Else. So that you would essentially. Restate the question. For the oh, people. sorry. Yes. <laughs> so the question was in a multifamily unit where they each unit has their own little uh, gas furnace. Can it be replaced with a heat pump? And based, since basically the external unit of a heat pump is just like an air conditioning unit. Um, it's got the reversing valve in it, but yeah. you can essentially replace that unit. In fact, that's what we did when we built our home. Our Both our furnace and our air conditioner were 20 plus years old. So they both had to be replaced. And so it was really an opportune time to go in and do that. But if there's your air conditioner, let's say is old, a lot of people will take simply the air conditioner as Wayne alluded to this earlier, replace it with a new air conditioner that's a heat pump, run that heat pump 90 plus percent of the time, leave their furnace in place and use the furnace if it gets super, super cold. But in, in there's, there's really not a problem with retrofitting something like that with a heat pump system or, and it could be a mini split system like this. I assume your, your, your units are ducted, right? You have normal floor ducts. I think so. Yeah. Yeah, so there'll be, there's a, in a cabinet someplace or a closet, there's a little vertical unit and there's probably a vent above it and, and then the ducts disappear under the floor. And, yeah. So my second question is, I heard Mrs. Stoltz last weekend talking about the Bryant neighborhood geothermal system and said, they were now starting plans to try to get grants to do that sort of system everywhere in Ann Arbor. So is there a problem if you invest money in a heat pump for your end of the house and then the city comes along and says, well, we want to replace your heating with a community system that pumps coolant or heating fluid into the house? Well, there's a couple of things. First of all, that, oh, <laughs> Ann Arbor is talking about doing district geothermal. So you have a bunch of wells that are connected in a loop, and then people pull heat or cool off of that loop to heat or cool their house. And they are in the process of trying to do a project down in the uh, Bryant community neighborhood. I think it's going to take a long time to do that. I think that there's some issues with cost potentially that may mean that it only goes in in certain areas and um, they're not gonna require you to hook up to it. So then the only difference is the efficiency between their geo loop and whatever you have. And how big is that? So you would, wouldn't like you to stop doing it right now. If you need a new furnace right now, there's no problem with that. Correct. Correct. Yeah. I, and, you know, and the future is always hard to predict before it's happened, doesn't it? Yeah. There, the, it's, a, it's really a good question. By the way, the University of Michigan is looking at doing exactly the same thing. And you can imagine the size of their geothermal fields are going to be massive. Um, I think they're talking on Palmer Field of putting in something like 200 six foot, 600 foot geothermal wells. And that field will be used for all the dormitories there on um, in that hill area, as well as I think even some of the uh, the buildings in the Michigan Medicine Hospital area. So, you know, that- I have, that's... I have heard them say that they, they will need 10,000 wells for mm -hmm. the entire camp. That's correct. Yep, yeah, that's the estimate. Yeah, so- um, but to Wayne's point about what they're doing in Bryant, it's it's a great project. The city got a five hundred thousand dollar 
grant to do an engineering study. That engineering study is in process right now. It'll take about a year and then it has to be implemented. And that is one neighborhood with 260 housing units. And the city has 50,000 housing units. And it's gonna be a long time before they go in and they put geothermal wells all over the city in the district fashion to be able to do all the different neighborhoods and subdivisions. So Wayne is absolutely right. If you were to put in your own geothermal system or your own air source heat pump, you're operating fairly efficiently as it is. Um, you don't get some of the economies of scale that you would get at a district level, but it's not like this is something where there is some wonderful new solution right around the corner that is gonna be massively better for the, you know, the, the people that are doing this or considering doing it in the short term. I, I wanted to mention on this slide, that unit is hung off a wall and you can have them set on the ground, which is the way mine is. Mm -hmm. And that's actually the preferred way. Now we're in snow company, so you have to put it up on a stand. Yeah. But when it's, and that's on a, a block wall. So it's fairly stable, but I've known ones to have resonating frequency with something. And so if you can put them on the ground, you're better off. Now your, your air conditioning unit is already up on the roof. And so if there was gonna be a problem, it would have shown up. Yeah. So I, I wouldn't worry about that in your case. Yes. Um, I'm sure you this one. So what, what's that? What's the difference between a ground source heat pump and a geothermal? They're the same, basically. Okay. Yes. So the question is, what's the difference between a ground source heat pump and a geothermal system? They're effectively the same thing. Yeah. The, I try to use ground source because that's where you're really getting the heat. Geothermal you think about hot springs, you know, and there in Europe, there are places where they actually heat whole towns with geothermal, which is running several hundred degree uh, heat that's coming out of the ground very close to the surface. So Ice, Iceland, for example, is using yeah. geothermal and there's also new geothermal systems that are um, in some cases already being piloted and then there's some even more radical ones that are um, that are under investigation where they're doing deep wells going 10,000 feet deep or even multiple kilometers deep to act to access these active geothermal fields where you're accessing for heating purposes uh, heat that are you know 300 500 degrees C which is then super super efficient as you can imagine for heating and that that whole breadth is geothermal. And what we're talking about for residential use is really, like Wayne said, ground source heat pump. It's just a well that's 300, 600 feet deep, something like that. Yeah, sure. Just, I don't know anything about this, but um, when you say well, what, I mean, thousands of wells in the ground in Ann Arbor, does that destabilize our ground? And also, we had a picture of a pond and with the heating coil going into the pond. So it's right. And does that ever get in the way of whatever's living in the pond? I mean, like, you know, changing the temperature of the water, would that affect the life in the pond? I just don't know. First, your, your first question was, are all these wells going to destabilize the ground? No, they're far enough apart and everything that they're not going to affect that. They will change the temperature in the ground locally a little bit, but I, that's not really going to be a factor. Depends on a residential scale, they're usually using a six inch well or an eight inch well. These may be larger because they're probably trying to get more heat transfer out of them. And these are not like, would you read about in some areas where they're doing wells with fracking and they're doing them to such a degree that they're actually seeing occasionally like small tremors. We're, we're not talking about anything like that. This is something that's a well. Um, there is actually an outer casing and typically what they call a U-tube. Think of a very, very long U 
is what what is actually going down into the ground. There's some that have different ty types of pipe configurations. So there's not something, anything that's that's moving. And um, you're drilling here into very, very stable uh, conditions. So there, that's not an issue. In the case of a loop system like this, uh, this is typically on the bottom of a pond or, or a well. You may have a little bit of a heating, if you will, in that vicinity, but you have a lot of water movement typically in these just from other, you know, wind and things like that. You're really not affecting uh, the, 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 let's say, the, uh, the ecosystem of the, of the pond. So there, it's, there, there's a certain size and depth that you want to have so that you don't get any issues either with freezing the whole thing right where it might not work as well um or disturbing um life so these are all good questions by the way yeah they really are there are places like i, I think toronto they have a pipe that goes out and they pull water out of lake erie and run it through heat exchangers to heat parts of the of toronto and dump the water back in. That's what they call an open loop system. And actually you may find that there's somebody selling a relatively cheap, what they call a geo thermal system that works off of your well. Don't go there yeah. because water quality is an issue. And if you think about how much you use your well in, in comparison to um, what it would take to heat your home, which is, running six gallons a minute anytime your furnace is running, it's pumping a huge amount of water out of the ground and it's running through a heat exchanger and with the amount of minerals that we have, it deposits minerals on the heat exchanger. It's just not a good thing. I think we had a question over here, a couple of them. Yeah, so uh, what factors should I consider when I'm uh, thinking about air source versus ground source? If I understood things correctly, they both can do it in the cold, as, as cold as we need. So that's probably not a big consideration. It looks like it might be just economics. A ground source would be more expensive up front and cheaper to run. Is there more to it than economics? Well, part of the reason that I didn't go with the ground source is that I didn't want to rip up my yard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which, you know, it's a short term issue, but. Uh, and there are people, for example, I've seen it uh, actually in our neighborhood where someone. Uh, timed it where they also um, wanted to replace a driveway. Yeah. So they had an old asphalt driveway or a concrete driveway, it was cracking all up. Um, they simply pulled that up, brought in the rigs, drigged their wells where the, the driveway is, um, hooked those all together and ran them into the house, into the geothermal system. So it's 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 both, what is are you gonna do in terms of disturbing your yard, including trees and things like that? I mean, if you bring in these rigs, you're gonna have, compaction of roots and things like that. I, we had some problems actually with one tree a little bit. Um, but uh, so it's it's the cost and it's your your landscaping. Um, and it is it, it is a you know fairly significant cost, although you can, as we say, you can borrow that money um, through Michigan Saves. You could do it with a second mortgage. There's you know various ways of doing that. And then the tax credit's really significant now, like Wayne said, 30%. So the other thing that you do eliminate by going this way is that you, you don't have an outside unit. So you don't have that, you know, what you have now sitting out there making a certain amount of noise. Mine is pretty quiet. Mine, mine is about this far away from my desk on the other side of the exterior wall. And most of the time I can't hear it. Occasionally there's a little bit of a hum. And once in a while in the wintertime, there's a, a, a frost. When it goes through its defrost cycle, it blows all the frost that's accumulated on the coil, and I go, "Oh, it's snowing out." <laughs> there, there is one that related to that. There is one benefit. So I mentioned we had air, an old air conditioning unit that was right outside um, a deck area where we sit an awful lot in the summertime. And if you have your air conditioner there, you know it cycles on and off and on and off, and you may even, depending on where it is, feel that the heat coming off of that. And like Wayne said because you don't have an outside coil and fan with a geothermal system, you're using the ground. So you don't have to have that air exchange. You eliminate that unit and you eliminate the cycling of the compressor and the fan and everything else. So that is an aesthetic or whatever you want to call it benefit. 
Yes. Is there a uh, right way or a wrong way to go about a home energy loss audit? If you live in Ann Arbor, do you live in Ann Arbor? Oh, I live in Canton. Okay, in Canton. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, is there a right way or a wrong way to get an energy audit? Uh, I would choose somebody that's reputable and then has done a lot of them. How do I? Well, Michigan Saves has a list on their website, I believe. Michigan Saves? Michigan Saves, the Michigan. loan company. S A V E S. My saves. My saves. Yeah. Or M I saves. Yep. Yeah. Um, there, can we uh, talk about individual? Um, I mean, there, 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 the Michigan Saves has a list. Um, there is a company that um, I've used a couple of times, um, and they. One one thing you need to be careful with an energy audit is um, there were our energy auditors that do just energy auditing, and that's all they sell. Um, there are also entities that use the energy audit as a way of entering into additional sales by doing insulation and things like that. There's actually very good arguments for doing it both ways. The first way is that you get someone who's potentially you know, very objective and is not trying to sell you anything. Um, I know a woman that owns, Wayne and I know a woman that, that owns a company and she did energy audits and that's the only thing she did. And she found that she was doing all these energy audits and no one really actually ever implemented anything. But because she, she now does insulation and all these other different kinds of things, she has a motivation um, to try to get the owners to actually do something and do something about climate change and things like that. So there's two sides to the coin, um, but you definitely, I think, want to do an energy audit with a blower door test and with an infrared camera. And what you're gonna get then is you're going to get some readings that tell you how well sealed your house is. And you're gonna get a lot of infrared photographs where you're going to be able to see in various shades of colors there, there you get color photographs. You can see exactly where there are cold spots or a lack of insulation in your house or where, for example, around a door or a window where you need to do improved sealing. So you, you, you I, I would highly recommend oh, doing one. And like Wayne said, they're, they're $200, $400. Um, and the, the ones that are done by the companies that also do insulation, they typically give a, a little bit lower rate with the idea that that will get them more business with the additional work coming down the road. Yeah, we, we already are pretty well insulated. Mm -hmm. This attic wise, not sure about walls. Uh, we already have solar. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm not sure you're saying do this before you do solar. But we've already done solar. Mm -hmm. uh, and in particular, I don't particularly trust DTE. Uh, Who so. does? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's okay that you already have solar. It's good. <laughs> um, are you on net metering or not? I'm not sure what the definition of that. Well, net metering doesn't exist anymore. But if you did it more than maybe six years ago with DTE, yeah. or well, we didn't do it with DTE. But, uh, no, I mean uh, you if you were in DTE territory, yeah. yes, and you did it six years ago, you probably have net metering which means that they're paying you the retail rate for whatever you put out onto the grid. Consumers kept it longer and I got in under their program, which is now gone. And so, and I have a fairly solar home with an air source heat pump. And so during the day, I don't use a lot of electricity and much goes out onto the grid at full daytime retail rates. And then my heat pump kicks on in, at night when there's a lower rate. And so I pay them less per kilowatt hour for what comes in. If you have that, you don't want to change your solar system because they'll knock you off of that rate. And the rate now is like half of, of the retail rate. So the return is longer for the solar. The, so the basic difference is net metering is, as Wayne said, 
when you buy electricity, you buy it at a certain rate. And when you overproduce and don't use it, you get credited at the same rate. There is now what they call inflow and outflow rates. And so when they got rid of net metering, the inflow rate that you pay is a lot higher than the outflow when you're producing ex, uh, ex, uh, 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 excess heat and the credit that you're getting is lower. If there's, it's it's like half, uh, it's even a little bit less than half, I think. I, I don't know exactly, but I suspect that we're getting less, we're paying more to, to get it and they're giving mm -hmm. us less. To... Yeah, that was changed about five or six years yeah. ago. So yeah. if that's the case, then if you have a space for more solar, you can always add that after you've installed a heat pump and are showing Higher DTE usage. that you're actually using them. Right. We could add more. We yeah, more, we have more space to add more metal. Yeah, that, that's yeah. what you'd want to do, whether it's you're adding a heat pump or whether you're adding an electric vehicle or whatever. Um, you should you should definitely think about uh, adding additional solar, which you can only do once you've shown the additional demand. So I have a system that's sized for my all electric home, the solar. I sort of planned it that way. And on an annual basis, about 70% of what I produce goes out onto the, onto the grid. So the grid is my friend. It, it's a, it's a, well, the ultimate the batter. The summertime, we're giving them yeah. more energy in the winter. We're right. Not producing right. Right. So as homes get tighter, do you ever run into a situation where you don't have enough airflow and you have to put in? heat exchanger to to get enough ventilation so the question is do, do you ever make your house so tight that you need ventilation uh, because it's getting too stuffy well my house is an example it originally had an oil fired furnace that just sucked air combustion air in through all the cracks wherever it could. So it didn't have an outside air source. And so when that was running, it gave me a lot of ventilation. Now, when I put in the air source heat pump, all that ventilation went away. And I found that I have a small bedroom that's my office and that, and I'm not, I, I, ha, I bought a, a CO2 sensor and I discovered that I was getting elevated levels in my office in the afternoon when I started to get sleepy. So I actually added a heat, what they call a heat recovery ventilator, which has two fans in it and a heat exchanger. And it brings in fresh outside air that goes through one side of the heat exchanger and it takes stale inside air and runs it through the other side of the heat exchanger and gives up 60 or 70% of the heat from the inside air to the outside air on the way in. And I could stay awake better in the afternoon. <laughs> So sometimes people do that um, with bathroom fans. Yeah. Too. They they would yeah. use a, 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 a heat recovery ventilator to do that. It, and, it's now required by code that you actually have fresh air supply as part of a, a heating system. So depending upon when your unit was built, it might have actually an outside air duct that is sucking a certain amount of outside air into the, to the unit. Some of you may have heard of passive house have you ever heard of that term so passive house is a house that has a very well sealed and well insulated envelope and that then minimizes of course your energy losses both in the winter but also even in the summertime um, it, it, it makes it more efficient to both heat and to cool and because those are so well sealed and insulated in those cases um, you, you probably need some type of uh, actual ventilation through like a heat recovery ventilator. Whatever happens if those underground wells malfunction, how do you go to fix it? Uh, failure rates on wells are, are almost non-existent. Um, as long as it's done right in the the plumbing is basically what amounts to one piece going down and up. There's not a really good way that it could fail 
tail. Um, there is a slight possibility if your heat transfer with the ground is really poor, like if, if it's all like beach sand and dry, that you may not actually have the heat transfer far enough out that you're always replenishing the heat or cold to the point that you avoid the imbalance. If you remember that slide that I had as to how much heating and cooling we required, if you don't act, if you're not actually able to transfer that heat farther out or that coolness farther out, you will actually change the temperature around the well over time. It's pretty uncommon. Um, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about it here, but that's, I mean, that's, if you talked about failure rates, that's one of the things that can happen. I haven't found out what the, what actually failed. I think there was a leak. And um, Lawrence Tech has a building with a whole geothermal system that according to somebody that I talked to, they just abandoned. And I think what they had, that it was a loop through several wells and they had leaked somewhere and they couldn't figure out where it was and they couldn't fix it. And what quite often happens with a big institution is they just say, well, let's do something else. So, um, but I don't know. I, I want to find out the particulars on that because it's really very rare. These things usually last a very long time and, and, um, and do quite well. Yeah, I think wells are typically, they say, you know, 50, 100 years easily. Um, and we were not talking about like a water well, you know, where pumps fail and things like that. I mean, there's, there are also pumps. You have a pump in this system, too. But those pumps are outside of the well system. They're accessible. So, you know, the part that's in the ground, um, unless you're doing something significant in terms of ground disturbances or something like that, we're not in a an active uh, earthquake zone or anything like that, where we're getting tremors or anything. So this really, it's, it's really not a, a consideration. Steve. Yeah, I have a house that has um, baseboard water heating. Mm -hmm. You know, that um, has a gas fired boiler. So um, you, you mentioned in the beginning that you can use air source heat pumps for heating water. Yeah. So um, this is an air to water heat pump. It's what they call a, a, a monoblock, which is very nice because it's more like a refrigerator. So there's no on site connections that are done with the refrigerant. And you have a water with antifreeze that goes out. There. The problem that you have is your baseboards were sized for probably 160 to 180 degree water. And this thing puts out 130 max and it actually works more efficiently if, if you're using a lower temperature than that. So you would have to, and I have charts about what those things would put out at that lower temperature. And it's probably less than a third of what the maximum was when it was put in. Now, if you've done a whole lot of energy efficiency, it's possible that you don't have to add very much to make up for that. If you've, if you've cut the energy, the heat loss in half in the house over what the system was sized for, so that you have a lot more baseboard than you now need, that it might be possible to do this easily without adding much. It, it works best with a radiant floor system, which only uses 95 to 105 degree water, depending upon what you put on the floor. Um, but they have European radiators that work a lot better at lower temperature and they're kind of neat looking. Um, so, but that's the unit itself, it gets more complicated because the way this usually works is you have a buffer tank. So it's just keeping the buffer tank warm. And then whenever it drops below the set point, it turns it on. It means that it cycles less, which makes it actually more efficient that way. And because it's a monoblock, I mean, I have a freezer in my basement that I think came, it came with the house. And I think it's from the 1960s. And it actually is relatively efficient. So I don't turn it out. So it's much more likely to have some issues with these systems if you've got on-site refrigerant connections which is what 
you know, your standard air conditioner has. It's what my air source heat pump has. Um, his geothermal system, I don't think there are any on-site refrigerant lines, so which is good. Um, but but these work, they're just expensive. Uh, um, in spec, partially because there's only two U.S. manufacturers. One of them is actually owned by a Finnish company. And then there's almost nobody who's installed. I don't, I'm not sure anybody's installed one in Ann Arbor. I've talked to the guy who's the rep for the company that makes them. And he kind of said, well, it's probably $25,000 just to get that unit on site. And it might include the buffer tank or not. You know, so it doesn't include anything else. So it's not going to be cheap. But it'll actually, according to some of the figures, that it'll actually outperform an air-to-air -air, air source heat pump to some degree. And I'm sure it'll, it should last a lot of time. Well, part of this, too, is that it uh, depends on how high you see the thermostat. For sure. Yeah. Those... Yeah. But as you get older, you have a tendency to want it warmer. <laughs> <laughs> my, my wife doesn't put up with really low temperature, but she's she's pretty good about it. But uh, not to knock your watch. <laughs> it's uh, I like it warm too, you know. So well. If there's no more questions, uh, or even if there are, Wayne and I can hang around for sure. a few more minutes. And Steve, do you have a question still again? Go ahead. Yeah, I've, had, I've, I've seen proposals over the last couple of years that um, you can use, like, in fact, where you use the city's sewer system as a heat exchanger instead of the mm -hmm. pumps. Yes. You can put the heat exchange tube in and then the city's stormwater. Wastewater yeah. district, Recovered. if yeah. you would. Yeah. Yeah. Is that economically feasible? Uh, actually, I don't know a whole lot about it, but I know the Ann Arbor third, 2030 district just had a lunch and learn yeah. session on that. And I know that there are there are systems in place uh, in, um, I think, Canada and in the United States yeah. and in, in Europe as well. Um, it's not something that has been done a lot, but, you know, there's a lot of people that are taking essentially water from a shower or from your sink or whatever. I mean, if you think of even just cold water that's going down the drain, that's 55 degrees because it's coming from the ground. And that 55 degrees is a lot warmer than the air is outside at minus 15 degrees. So there's a lot of what warmth in waste water, you know, especially if you we were talking about the University of Michigan, where you have all those dormitories and you have thousands of students every day showering and everything else they're doing. And that's just all going down in the sewer system. And it's right now it's just going to waste. So it is wasted heat that could be harnessed for at least augmenting whatever we might be doing with um, a geothermal system of some type or with air source heat pumps. Now you, you do have to have your local utility uh, wastewater utility online to, you know, to want to do this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, so you have to. Yeah. Has uh, OSI thought about this at all? I imagine it's crossed their minds. I, I'm. I haven't had a conversation with them about it. No. My you know. my hope is this is engineering study for the Bryant neighborhood. We'll look at that as one of the engineering options and evaluate what the cost of that would be and what the payback is and how that compares to drilling additional wells or whatever the case may be. The only thing you don't want to do is freeze it. <laughs> and, and, you know, people who run utilities have a tendency to look at the worst case scenario or what they're used to doing and not want to do different. Sometimes it has to do with who's in the way. Yeah. Yeah. First, uh, thanks for this to both of you. This is great. Um, just a quick question. Do you have any advice for finding uh, vendors or contractors? Michigan Saves has a contractor list. They have a special heat pump certified. It's not certification, but it's somebody that's looked at their program and does them and everything. Um, thanks. We can talk to you afterwards and give yeah. you a few recommendations too. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Thank you.
time. Any any closing? That's the end of the program. Do you need to do anything? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you all so much for coming. We'll see you next month back here at Mathai. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.